So this very interesting image is of jazz musician Daryl Davis. He's uh, the black guy. And interestingly enough, um, he when he was a boy, he didn't understand why someone would hate him without even knowing him. So he set out to be the friend a bunch of different Klansmen at all levels. Well, he eventually went to their houses. He got to know them. They went to came to his house. And even as he was invited and to different rallies and stuff like that, he became better and better friends with some of these guys. And um, in fact, he was even asked to speak at, I guess, a KKK event as well, which is quite interesting. Through all this, he he has helped bring around 40 to 60 KKK members out of the Klan. And um, he was helped with the impetus to bring out close to 200 people total out of the KKK. And through this all, he has gained about 45 KKK robes from former KKK members, which is quite interesting just by just by being befriending people and understanding them and listening to them. So when we're talking about racism, we want to talk about these really interesting, this really interesting story of someone who's doing a really interesting action, reaching out and trying to understand where the other person is coming from. This is really relevant in today's day and age because this is such a big political controversy. Um, and we see the cultural wars and all this stuff. And we as Christians often like to just stay out of it because it's like, I don't want to get involved, you know. And, and we see the BLM protests, the Antifa looting, the, we see a lot of the, the poverty in the inner city and the ghetto conditions. And people just feel like a victim. We see the deaths of Jacob Blake and Walter Scott and George Floyd and wonder, okay, what, if any of these have to do with racism or these caused by racism or is this some sort of structural racist then we read about white fragility and critical theory we see the media and politicians consistently seeming to stir race relationships however when we look at this a lot of times we get fatigued but we have to remember we are not dealing necessarily with politics in a sense but rather with spiritual powers ephesians six twelve says for we wrestle not against flesh and blood but against principalities and against powers and against rulers of the darkness of this world against spiritual weakness in high places this and then we go, that goes on and talks about the cure of how to do this um with putting the whole armor of god how to fight against spiritual wickedness so if, if I was someone who had a cure for a super dangerous disease, and if you had that disease, you would really want me to give it to you, you know? Or if, if I had that cure, I'd really want to give it to other people. And that's what we have here. We have the cure for the disease of racism that we really need to, to address and hand out. Now, when we think about racism, um, a lot of times racism can have multiple meanings. Um, there's a old saying that says the battle of ideas is over the definition of words. Another old saying says when words lose their meaning, people lose their freedom or people lose their lives. And so we have to really define racism accurately and um, systematically here. Um, there's two, at least two different types of racism, individual racism and more systemic, systemic racism. Individual racism is where you individually are at a personal level deciding to do something for racist reasons like you don't want to hire someone because of their skin tone or ethnic background. A systemic racism would be more of an institutional level where it's, it, we build in laws or systems such as Jim Crow or Nazism, segregation and affirmative action all are actually systemic racist policies, strangely enough, or at least for affirmative action. Um, and when we look at racism, racism has changed over the years. But if you go to the old time dictionaries, like the Cambridge Academic Content Dictionary, it says that racism is the belief that some races, or which we could say ethnic groups, are better than others, or the unfair treatment of someone because of his or her race or eth ethnic group. Now, when we look at the old issue of racism, we have to remember that things have changed over the years. And that's why I illustrate this point with this circle here. The circle, let's just say it represents 200 years of the worst of racism. Let's say the highest peak of racism, this was racism. So this includes Jim Crow, segregation, and Nazism. And um, now this does not um, uh, necessarily disregard the KKK skinheads and affirmative action, white supremacy, black supremacy, neo-Nazis, critical race theory, uh, the BLM movement, alt-right, alt-anti-Semitism. These types of things are still with us. 
but this is at the height of the racist mindset within especially the West and especially the United States. Recently, I, I asked a specific group what type of racism they experienced, and I got all sorts of answers from racist actions against people from all different types of ethnic groups, which is quite interesting to me. So it's not just like one ethnic group is being, um, being uh, receiving racist responses or being denied different privileges because of their races. race. It, it comes from across the board. Now, when we look at today's day and age, we know that we ended slavery. We implemented ethnic civil rights. We demolished Nazism. And we see that minorities at usually are the blunt end of, blunt end of um, racism are in all levels of athletics and politics and mu music and celebrities. I mean, you see doctors, lawyers, professors, TV, radio show hosts, well, we have to remember, um, as we're talking about this, how, why is this even an issue? Why are we even addressing this? We have come a long way, but why would we address this? Well, it's, it, racism is only an issue in the Western mindset. Um, maybe some other mindset would talk about it, but it doesn't really make sense to really discuss it that much. In the West, we have a Christian worldview, and this is why racism is so controversial. Our tribalism is so controversial. Society now is living on the fumes of Christian ideas. Society looks down on people who are racist and acting in racist ways and if you make racist laws. Um, and we make, we put these laws in place to prevent racist actions. So today, like I said before, we're living on the fumes of the Christian worldview. Now, as we go in here, we want to understand like where does racism come from? What what what's what's the basis of it? What's the past? Now there could be a million different things that lead to racism, um, but here's just some things that come to my mind that um, really seem to point to um, some of the some of the effects of racism today. And then we want to look at what can we learn from it so we don't repeat not only being racist but also repeat um, some of the same types of mistakes in other areas of our life and culture and in Christianity, and how can we have an answer to racism? So, so these are the big questions that we want to answer as we're talking about this today. So the first one that I noticed is that all through history, there has been slavery. Slavery is probably one of the big items, especially in the West, that is the cause of, of racism. Uh, but like I said before, slavery has been very common in all, all, all of history. Egyptians, Asians, Greco-Romans, Jews, Indians, Africans, all of these people own slaves. Um, and in fact, even to, to, in today's day and age, about 50, about close to 50% of the world's nations, slavery is not illegal. That does not necessarily mean that they have slaves, but it's not illegal, which is quite stunning. In fact, there are approximately 40 million people in modern slavery today. And approximately just in Africa alone, it's about 9.2 million people enslaved. At the height of the slave trade, um, a transatlantic slave trade, the U.S. received probably close to 250 to 400,000 um, Africans as slaves. And um, over the hundreds of years of the, the transatlantic slave trade to Brazil, to the Caribbean, and to North America, there was approximately 10 million people that were transported to the New World from Africa. By the time of the Civil War, 1850s, around that area, we had approximately 6.5 million slaves in the United States, and most of these slaves were born in the United States. They were not transported in. So as we think about slavery, though, within the Christian world, in view, it does not make sense. The church has, as, in, as a whole has been against slavery from the start. It doesn't make sense. Now, a lot of times in the Bible and the New Testament especially, it says, hey, if you're a slave, you know, do the best job you can do. But if you can get free, get free. So when the fall of Rome happened and the medieval Christian, Christianity rose, well, guess what? It led to the fall of slavery. How could you love someone that you enslaved? How could you? That just doesn't make sense. Um, how could you be a master of another person? This does not make sense either. How can you have communion with someone who's lower than you? That doesn't make sense. The next point where that leads leads to racism could be money. Um, this comes out from the American paradox: all men are created equal, and we also have enslaved Africans. This does not make sense. To do this, though, we either have to free the African slaves, or else we have to dehumanize certain people, which we did. We dehumanized the Africans, 
in the 17 and 1800s, especially the 1800s. And um, this is what happened in Nazi Germany with the Jews and gypsies. This is what Hitler did. And in today's day and age, we're doing this right now with the unborn. We're dehumanizing them and saying, hey, they're, they're not worthy of life. And why do we do this? Why, why have we done this with the history? And why do we do this now? Because of money and, and prosperity. We want our own. We, we're selfish pe people. So the love of money, the love of prosperity is the root of all evil. The next one is tribalism. There's always been tribalism all through history. My group is better than all the other groups. Um, missionary uh, Klaus Kugler, he was a missionary to the Fayu people of the Papua New Guinea. And he said that the tribes are always warring with each other until the gospel came. When the gospel came and they start receiving the gospel and becoming Christians, all of a sudden they became relieved because they didn't have to fight anymore. And we also see tribalism happening in the Indian caste system. We have a number of different levels, you know, priests, academics, all the way down to the outcasts. We see similar structures in Egypt and Europeans and New World Spanish rule and British rule. We see the caste system or a similar system like the caste system, not quite as radical as the Indian caste system. Also, we see the state. The state has also been at the forefront of actually um, promoting different types of um, racist actions. Think about Jim Crow or Nazism, legalized ethnic slavery, and discrimination, segregation. Even today, the welfare culture has unfortunately bred the ghetto mentality, the victimhood mentality. It creates animosity, uh, inferiority complex, and meaningless of life. It's like, okay, um, if I have no purpose in life. So the welfare state pretty much has uh, created economic depression. We see an increase in broken families. We see no guidance and purpose. Guys do not have the focus of having the responsibility of becoming a father. They don't want that commitment. We see a decrease in confidence, an increase in inferior, for inferiority complex. People feel like a victim and feel like everyone's out to get to them. Uh, we see disrespect. And then we also see, um, with this whole idea of state, I'm going to say is a revisionist of history as well. The revisionist of of how we look back through history of, of rulers and leadership through the state. And we see this from like Howard Zinn, who is a historical Marxist historical revisionist. And he promotes the idea that oh, the American culture was founded upon racist ideas. And when we, when we say stuff like this, which may be the truth, and if it is, it needs to be said, but not everyone was. And also we create more racism today where people are at each other's throat constantly. It's not my fault. I can't take responsibility. The next one is science. Science is interesting because, and I'm going to go a little more deep detail with science, because um, this gave, science helped give racism an authoritative edge, a science, you know, the, the white coat looking person saying, hey, science says, you know, and, and so this is what happened here in the situation. In 1906, there was an African boy, his name was Aoto Begni. Actually, he wasn't a boy, he was a young man. And he was caged in the Bronx Zoo with um, some um, orangutans and other organisms. Here he is right there. And, and it's quite crazy. So we had this huge Christian outcry. Well, eventually he was released, fortunately, but he was uh, put into a home um, helped give him given an education and given a life, but even then his whole life was shattered. I mean, his his whole culture was shattered. So eventually he committed suicide, which is a very sad story. It's just heartbreaking to hear this story. What people did to this this guy is just horrid. And, it's, and he's just one of the many in Australia. The natives of Australia they were hunted down in the 1800s, and from the from the early 1800s to the mid 1900s, scientific racism and Darwinism gave racism strong credence. It's like, hey, you know, we have good evidence that oh, there's different racial um, levels. From and and also even before that time, we see David Hume and Immanuel Kant um, in the 1700s and the 1800s. Other philosophers like Marx and Engels also promoted racist ideas as well. One guy who was considered the father of scientific racism was Samuel Morton. He had this five-point uh, leveling system or five-point segregation system where he said the Caucasians and the whites were the most intelligent race and at the bottom were blacks. This guy was extremely racist and just just horrid what he said and what he did. Um, Charles Darwin, in his first book called The Origin of Species, uh, most people don't know the rest of the title, The Origin of Species by Means of Natural Selection or the Preservation of Favored Races in Struggle for Life. 
This was written in 19, excuse me, in 1859. Well, most people just know about the origin of species. That's all they have ever heard about when talking about Darwin. But Darwin also wrote another book, a second book called The Descent of Man and the Selection of the Rela in Relation to Sex. This was done in 1871. And interestingly, the second book, unlike the first book, the first book really didn't talk about human human interaction, human evolution, but the second book did. In the second book, he had many racist ideas uh, throughout the book. And I could give you a number of them, but one I want to give you is from chapter six, the ones you see right now. He says that Africans and Australians look closer are closer to gorillas than Europeans. So Europeans are up top, Africans and Australians in the middle, and the, the gorillas are at the bottom. That's what this quote's saying here which is quite crazy. And with this, we see the rise of, of racism that's propagated even faster than it was before, after Darwin. In fact, Stephen Jay Gold, Gold which was, he's quite a, quite a famous a scientist from the 1900s, throughout the 1900s. And he said that um, biological arguments for racism may have been common before 1850, but they increased in orders of magnitude following the acceptance of evolutionary theory. And so evolution brought humans down to the level of animals. And now, since there was no need for some sort of creator, morals had no absolute grounding. In fact, Darwin and his cousin, Francis Galton, were considered the founders of eugenics. Their busts were at the, the entrance of the Third International Congress of Eugenics in 1932 as the founders. They were put there as the founders of eugenics. If you don't know what eugenics is, eugenics is, is an idea that promoted forced sterilization, harsh standards for immigration, and selective breeding because they wanted only the best humans to survive. Just like as how you'd breed cattle or dogs, you're looking for specific traits. Well, here it is. Well, guess what? Hitler came along and many other sympathetic uh, elites and progressives, and they promoted eugenics. And well, Hitler, he, he, gave, he actually put to use the ideas of eugenics on the Jewish problem, and he had a solution. And we all know what that solution was, that horrid solution. Well, a lot of times we're sitting there struggling like, okay, um, we have another question talking about science and we're talking about genetics, talking about races and, and things like that. It's like, well, the question that people often ask is like, what about Adam and Eve? Did Adam and Eve give rise to all our skin variations? You know, we know that the, the father of modern race, scientific racism, which was Samuel Morton, he thought that there were five races that came from five separate creations. So what does the modern science say? What does modern genetics say now? Well, we know that there's hundreds of different genes involved in, in just uh, characteristics of a human being. Uh, it could be skin tone and other characteristics as well. But with remember that we all have the same pigmentation, same color. We just have different levels different amounts of this pigmentation called melanin. And so if we look at Adam and Eve, we know that Adam and Eve, if they were at the beginning, if they had a neutral or mid-tone uh, skin tone, they could give rise to people from very light skin tones to very dark skin tones. So if you notice here, the less pigment genes, let's just say they're small a, small b, and small c, um, we know that Adam and Eve, if Adam and Eve both had a genes for all those, and if and if they also had the more pigment genes, uh, let's say big A, big B, and big C, and if they had equal amounts of each one of those, just those three genes, three types of types of genes, well, they give rise to a mass of different numbers of people with different types of skin tones. And so we also see that those with the mid skin tones would actually be the majority of the offspring, but it'd give you a wide variety of tones of skin. So we all really are brothers in we all really are brothers in um, in Adam and Eve. Another thing we all we wonder about is a lot of times we think that there's this huge genetic diversity within different populations of humans, like Asians, Africans, and Europeans, and maybe Native Americans or whatever. But actually, what does the science tell us? We assume these, like let's say these overlapping circles here, is that we assume that they're wide differences, but actually they overlap almost um, completely. Uh, the, most, the most genetic diversity is confounded in the African population, but Asian and, and Europeans also have a, a genetic uh, variations that are well within each other and well within the, the African population. 
In fact, there are probably more genetic differences of individuals within populations than between populations. And like I said before, we are truly uh, brothers and sisters. We live in a small world that has been highly mobile and we've been moving from place to place, from various places and marrying different people from different backgrounds. So um, as we think about this, so as we're thinking about this, though, we have uh, many Europeans and Native Americans have a lot of Central Asian genetics, interestingly enough. And many Europeans also have African DNA if you go far enough back. And we have to remember that um, every two, any two per people that we pick on the planet are pretty much about 99.9% .9 similar genetically. So the item of the idea of race really doesn't mean much today in science. Also, we have to remember that we're not made in the image of chimps, but rather made in God's image. We're not 98 or 99 genetically similar to chimps. Rather, we're probably closer to 85% genetically similar. And like I said before, we're over 99.9% .9 genetically similar to other human beings. So yeah, we're not related to chimps. So as we're looking at this, our last item that we really want to look at is the rise of racism. Well, what else caused racism? Well, in, if we look through history, actually religion helped cause racism. A lot of times we see the historical misuse of religion that promoted slavery and racism, and many spineless pastors gave rise to slavery and gave it a theological credence. Um, there is an organization today called Kingdom Identity Ministries, and if you go to the website, you will be blown away, which I'll, I'll quote a couple of their ideas, but a couple of their state, a couple of their points for the statement of faith. Um, they are a cult of Christianity, but there are other cults of Christianity are out there too. And a lot of these cults actually promote racism or promoted racism. We think about um, LDS and J JWs. We think about the Nation of Islam, KKK. Yes, that's a cult as well. The Black Hebrew Israelites, that's another cult. Um, Black Lives Matter and critical theorists, that, those are religious in nature. Both of those organizations are religious. Um, they all promote a racist mindset and how they look at the world. Those organizations, maybe not individuals who hold to certain ideas, but as an organization, they all have in the past or do now hold to racist ideas. Let's just look at the most interesting one, the Kingdom Identity Ministries. They say this in their statement of faith. They say the white Anglo-Saxon, Germanic, and kindred people to be God's true literal children of Israel, this, this chosen seed line making up the Christian nations, stands far superior to all the peoples in their call as God's servant race. They go on to say, um, we believe as a chosen race, we are called to come out and be separated people, include segregation from all non-white races. They, they say that race mixing is an abomination in the sight of Almighty God, a satanic attempt meant to destroy the chosen seed line. Ouch, that's just crazy. That's just sick. <laughs> I don't know. It's just like, yeah. All right. Let's go on. Christian churches. This is where it really hits home. The, the cults, we can say, okay, they're crazy. But throughout history, many churches have stopped being churches and they divorce themselves from biblical truth. And when we as Christians separate ourselves from biblical truth, we regret it in the future. Once I met a older preacher who took up a church in the South and and um, once he preached a sermon against racism, and afterwards one of the members came up to him and told me, you never preach a sermon like that again. He was stunned. He didn't know how to respond. He was like, what? You know, he's like, if you do, you will lose your job. So it was also sometimes the people in the pews that um, pushed for it. But as Christians, we cannot capitulate to those types of attitudes. We look through history and look see the Southern and American Baptist split in the mid 1800s over the issue of slavery. We know that the Episcopalian Church split, one of the Episcopalian congregations split in the South over whether or not to allow um, black people to pray. Um, the Presbyterian, a Presbyterian pastor, he promoted slavery and white supremacy, and even BJU, which is a fundamentalist, fundamental um, Baptist or fundamentalist type of uh, college, they admitted only whites um, in the early. 19 to mid 1900s. It was not until 
2000s that the ban on interracial dating and marriage was lifted, and they apologized for their past racism, fortunately. Um, but this whole idea that you hear in today's day and age that, oh, you know, I've seen it before. We're different people uh, of African ethnicity, ethnicity say that, oh, Christianity is a, is a white man's religion. But here's the point. There are many African early church fathers and leaders and people from Africa who were Christians. The Ethiopian eunuch in Acts 8. He was an African. Tertullian, Cyprian, Athanasius, and Augustine were all from Africa. So this whole idea that it's just only European, no, that's false. It doesn't make sense. Nor should we as Christians assume that um, they have this racist mentality because the early church did not have that. They just say, like, we're one body wherever we're at in the world. So the underlying foundation of racism, though, we know that slavery, money, tribalism, state, science, and religion have all contributed to the rise of racism. But we know that racism is grounded upon something called sin. We're sinners, we're twisted, we, we're mean, we're selfish, and we're, we're bad. We do bad things. And the fix actually is the gospel. If we follow Christ, not culture, that's the fix. We need to obey God, not man. Now, as we look at this, we're wondering, like, what would we have done? What would we have done? We asked, where was a church during slavery, during Nazism, racism, eugenics? Would we have stood firm? Would we have taken the scripture seriously, no matter what the culture says? And this is really important. You know, as we look back through history, many churches built their, their doctrine upon what the culture says, what society says. However, if they would have went to the Bible, they would have had a firm foundation. Today, we also are exposed to ideas that um, tell us that this is right or wrong, and it opposes biblical truth. Now, there's some things that society says, such as murder and slavery and discrimination and racism and racist language and pedophilia. Well, pedophilia, maybe not for long, but um, are all wrong. And we agree with that. But we should stop trying to keep up with other cultures and other denominations and stuff like that. We need to go back to the scriptures, go back to what the apostles taught and Jesus taught in the scripture. And we, when we follow Jesus's way, we deconstruct racist Racism in general and racist attitudes. Society says that these are good. What well, are they? Promotion of LGBT and sexual immorality in general. Do we fall prey to this? How about public immodesty, critical radical feminism and critical theory, Marxism? Society says these things are good. Drunkenness, revelings, wild partying, uh, reproductive rights, which means pro-abortion, blasphemy and vulgarity, mass expropriation, which means looting by rioters, which is actually a book that argued for this. Society says this is good, but what does the Bible say? It says no to all of these. We cannot fall prey to what society says. It is hard to stand up for truth, yes, but here's the thing. What's the worst people will do to you at the church? Would they stone you? Would they decapitate you or defenestrate you or even crucify you? Well, no, probably not. At worst, some will probably ridicule you or probably not even that. They probably will just ignore you in silence. Or maybe unfriend you on social media. Eh, what about that? I mean, who cares? But here's the thing. Maybe people will listen. And maybe people will change your mind. Remember, Daryl Davis. He helped change some minds just by conversing with people. So we're, we're stuck with the... We need a key. We need the golden key to answer the race problem. And we know that secularism and atheism cannot give answers. They have no logical or moral basis for for this for this question critical race theory and anti-racism and blm doesn't work because you can't fight racism with more racism it, it just doesn't work the government can't do it we, we saw that but we do hold the golden key the golden key actually is the gospel and when i say that i have the answer as a gospel it's not like me being bombastic or like oh i know so much it's no it's like one beggar showing him another beggar where to find bread and so that's how we need to come across with the answer here. So when we look at the gospel fruit, is how does it come across? How does the gospel come out in our life? Remember, God is not a God of balance and moderation. Rather, he's a God of extremes. God's attributes run in parallel 
with fiery, furious, and exaggerated forward motion. For example, God is full of grace and he's full of truth. He's full of goodness and full of righteousness. He demands us to be the same way. I mean, think about this. He calls us to love, but he calls us to obedience. He calls us to trust, but he calls us to action and, and, and good works. He calls us to reason and he calls us to faith. You see, God's full of righteousness and judgment and justice. He's, he has these in full amounts. Righteousness means the rightness or rectitude or even a, a variation of justice. Justice means a verdict or proper judicial law, divine law, justice, judgment, order, ordinances, right, the right way of doing things. So we need to be thinking about this as we go forward is that we need righteousness and judgment and we justice. And if we don't have righteousness, we can't have justice. So we need to found, ground our foundation upon Jesus and his righteousness. And then we follow Christ and we can see justice in our society. Often we see have this problem of us versus them. There was once a two brothers, they're farmers, and they were close. They worked hard every day and worked together all the time. One time they had a fight and they became enemies, vicious enemies. Well, between the two properties or two houses, there was this creek that passed through. And over the years, they got angry and angry at each other. And one day, one of the brothers was about ready to go to town to do some shopping for the farm. And he's going to be gone all day. And as he was about ready to leave, he saw a man walking down the driveway toward his house. And the man said, hey, sir, he's like, I'm a carpenter. I would love to have a little job for the day. Do you have anything that needs to be built? The farmer's like, sure. Actually, I have a fence I want to make. And I want this fence between the other side of that river there. I want a fence on my side of the river. Why? Because I do not like that other guy. Who he is is my brother, and I hate him passionately. I don't like him. The carpenter's like, man, I think I understand your predicament. I'll take good care of you. And so the farmer leaves, and the carpenter gets to work. Well, a number of hours later, the farmer comes back, and as he's coming back to come and look down, come down to the creek to look at his fence, as he's walking down to the creek to look at his fence, he is stunned, he is frustrated, he is very angry, because instead of a fence, he sees a bridge. The carpenter is just finishing up the bridge, and he's about ready to holler at the carpenter when... He sees, he looks up and he sees his brother running down the hill towards the bridge. And he's running towards the bridge. He runs across the bridge and throws his arms around the first brother. And the other brother from the other side of their creek says, Brother, I'm so sorry. I was such a mean brother. And here you come along and build a bridge. Wow. So we as Christians, we need to be building bridges. Building bridges. We're not us versus them. We're either we, we, we're together. We, we need to end the sin of partiality and tribalism. We need a safe, trustworthy bridge that unites us. We need to leave our comfort and sh of the shore and enter to the center, a safe center. And that, that center is the gospel, God's word, God's ways, God's wisdom. And if we submit to God's kingdom and God's lordship and God's kingship, we can do great things. We need to have this kingdom-minded bridge that goes back to the scriptures. So let's look at some of the planks that may build this bridge or may be form the, the basis of this bridge. The first thing we need to know is that we are made in God's image. Thus, you are worth so much. Think about Genesis 1, 27. God created man in his own image. In the image of God, created he him, male and female, created he them. We can communicate, we can think, we can make decisions, we rationalize, we love, we hate. We are personal beings. We can worship, learn. We can do history. We can have creativity. Remember, we're not made in the image of a chimp or a monkey or an ape. We're made in God's image with creativity. And we're made with diversity. And we need to celebrate God's creativity and diversity. We need to end the whole idea of judging from the external, but rather judge the internal. We have to remember that we have more in common with others than in contrast with them. The second item, the second plank, would be one blood. We're all made of one blood. Abraham Lincoln supposedly would tell people, it's a great day for the race. And when someone would respond, race? I didn't know there's a race. Abraham Lincoln would say, the human race. You see, we are all part of the human race. Acts 17, 26 says, And God made of one blood all nations and men to dwell on the face of the earth. We're one blood. 
We're, we're all human, made of the same type of flesh. We're all brothers and, and sisters in Adam and Eve. So we need to stop focusing on the outliers who want to divide us and rather focus on the similarities that unite us. The third plank, identity. We can stop being obsessed with our idolatrous focus on our racial identity or our background. Now, that's secondary. That's great. We can celebrate that, but that's not our main focus. That's not our main identity. Our identity is Jesus, not our skin tone, not our ancestry, not our anything else. We're not black Christians or white Christians or Native American Christians or Asian Christians. It doesn't matter. We're Christians. Galatians 3, 27 and 28 says, For as many of you have been baptized in Christ, have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither bond nor free. There is neither male nor female. For ye are all one in Christ Jesus. We all have the same sin nature. We all need the same salvation. You see, Jesus died for us all, and he died for us all because we are worth it. We, we, we are worth it so much to him. So we should walk with confidence in, in a respectable manner because Jesus really did die for us. So if you're a Jesus follower, you're, you're part of the Jesus kingdom or the Jesus race, if you want to put it that way. You're worth something. The next item, the next plank that we really want to dig down on is love. Now, there's so many passages I could bring up for love uh, that's so important but um, let me just give you a few of them here. John 15, 12. This is my commandment that you love one another as I have loved you. Mark 12, 31. Love, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. In fact, 1 John says this. If, if you love not your, your brother, you abide in death. Matthew 6. This is Jesus speaking. If you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will forgive you. But if you forgive not men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive you your trespasses. Wow. That hurts, right? I mean, you can think about the person that you're angry at right now or you're not forgiving. You better forgive them because Jesus calls you to forgive them. And the next item that comes from the, the biblical bridge, the plank is esteem. Philippians 2, 3 says, Let nothing be done through strife or vainglory, but in loneliness of mind, let each esteem others better than themselves. In fact, in Ephesians 3, 8, Paul said this, um, Unto me who am less than the least of all saints is a grace given that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. How can we esteem others if we have partiality and racism and slavery? It doesn't make sense. How, how can we esteem others if we do violence to others or think ill of them? J James 2, 1 says, My brother, have not the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ the Lord of glory with respect of persons. You cannot have Jesus and have respect of certain people. Like, oh, this person is better than this person. I respect this person so much better. Like this person is better or this race is better. We can't do that. The last item that we really want to look at is unity. John 17, 20 through 21 says this. This is Jesus praying. Neither pray I for these alone, but for them also which shall believe in me through their word, that they all may be one, as thou, Father, art in me, and I in thee, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that thou hast sent me. You notice that it's directed at us. It's directed at the Christian church altogether. You also notice that unity does not mean uniformity. Unity does not mean there's not going to be differences. It's not uniformity. You see, Jesus defines unity, and he defines it as how Jesus and the Father are one. So we need to look at how Jesus and the Father are one and see how we should be one. Well, why do we have unity? Well, Jesus answers that as well. So the world will believe that the Father sent Jesus. You see, we're one blood, one race, one God, one Lord, one Savior, one baptism. Think of a, bo a body, a human body. No matter which part you are, the hand, the foot, the kidney, the lung, you're still trying to keep the same person alive. We're all doing the same task, trying to keep someone alive with the same goal. You don't want a kidney cell doing what the bone cell does or a bone cell doing what the nerve cell is supposed to be doing or a nerve cell is doing what the skin cell is supposed to be doing. Each of us have different things to be doing in our life. And that's fine. That's how God made it. So we need to celebrate that diversity of what he's given us, different responsibility. When people promote division when people blaspheme against other people when people gossip about other people talking about each other behind their backs they really should be admonished and if the admonishment doesn't work then they 
should biblically, the Bible talks about them being excommunicated. They, they're they not following Christ. They're called in division, not unity. As Christians, we should be the light on the hill, showing unity, not division. So this brings us to the final point that I want to make is what can we do? What can we do? Well, if everyone was like you, what what would the world be like? Would it be better or, for, or would it be worse? Are you the change you want to see? So we want to look at ourselves. We want to look at our own actions. Do we take responsibility for our life? Do we have the have a victim or a victor response to life? Are we in control of our emotions? Are we focused on the past failings or the present and future possibilities? Do we walk respectfully and respectably? Do we have empathy and do we try to understand before trying to be understood? This is hard. I know. Remember, when you understand others, when you try to listen to them and hear them out, don't let their, their criticism of you become a judge of you. You know who you are. And remember, to understand someone does not necessarily mean that you agree with them. The more you learn about somebody, the more you talk to them, the closer you get to them. And even if it's a heated conversation, it still means that you're having a conversation. You're still building a relationship, even if that conversation is heated. So what? Talk about it. Even if someone's banging their fist against the table, you're still in that conversation. You have not quit the conversation. You are not fighting, physically fighting. You have not separated. So join that conversation. Listen and interact. Second thing, family and friends. Do you train your children about God's creativity? God has diversity. Do you pray for and put yourself in cross-cultural encounters? Do you invite people from other ethnic backgrounds over for supper? This is a big one. Get different other families from different backgrounds at your supper table. Do you encourage your family's friendships with other ethnic groups? This is big. Is your family an example that all your neighbors can follow? Do you focus on God's most fundamental institution, your family? This is so important. The family's going to change the world if we're in, if we're in changes. So we look at politics today and we're like, oh, what do we do? Change your family. Change you and your family. This is where you need to be starting. Definitely impact the culture around you, impact the presidential races and the congressional races, but your family is the focus. If you want to change the world, start with your family. The next step, what if every authentic Christian congregation would live out the fruit of the Spirit? As a congregation, are you equally welcoming to people from other ethnic backgrounds? As a congregation, do you focus on unity within God's kingdom? As a congregation, do you go overboard in forgiveness? Do you just go outside your your what you thought before? Just forgive people. Forgive before they ask for forgiveness. As a congregation, do you despise gossip? I mean despise. I use that word for a reason. Do you despise gossip with a passion? Do you despise backbiting with a passion? Do you actively remove yourself from those conversations? Get out from those conversations. Just say, I'd rather not be in this conversation. Make it known that you're not interested in gossip. And do not participate. Try to remove yourself from those conversations. That's one of the best ways to help prevent disunity. If we can't love our own family, our own church, our own friends, and um, Jesus followers, how can we love others from the culture which we are called to love? How can we love our enemies? This just doesn't make sense. You have to love your fellow Christian. And lastly, how are you involved in the culture and society around us? Are you involved in the community? How about homeless missions and as a mentor at pregnancy centers? What about teaching parenting and motherhood and fatherhood classes? When you go and hire people, do you really try to reach out to others fairly? Do you Are you trying to be partial to someone or are you trying to just fairly reach people for their the merits? Can you help people exit the victimhood mindset into a victor mindset? We can be victors. Don't let people judge you and encourage other people to do the same thing. Reach out to those, those in society that are have this vic victimhood mentality. Do you look at down at others if they can't actually succeed? This is, this is um, something huge. A lot of times in the, the progressive white community, there's this idea that um, I've, I've heard I have a black friend who told me this, that a lot of times these progressive whites look down on him. It's like, oh, I have to help you out because you're black. And he's like, it's just so annoying. It's like, it's so degrading. He's like, I'm a person. Treat me as a human being. Don't treat me as less than a human being. And same with as a, if you are feeling like you're 
lower than other people. Stop that. Stop lowering your standards for yourself. You hold yourself to high standards. Hold your others to high standards. Why assume that other people, that you or someone else can't keep it? You are a human being. You're God's creation. You have so much potential. All right. So where do you go from here? Some number of different resources you could check out. I have a Facebook group called Love Thy Black Neighbor. Um, definitely check that out. I try to uh, invite people from all different types of ethnic backgrounds. I'd love to have you on board if you're on Facebook. Definitely ask to be um, included. Um, everyblm.org is an awesome website. Wokentruth.com is a friend of mine who's who writes this website. He is a solid Christian who wants to see an end to this type of thing. And he comes from a purely biblical mindset on this. It's amazing. His, his ideas. So definitely go there. Blackfamiliesmatter.org. A great website, uh, Center for Biblical Unity, amazing woman who runs that, slowlyright.com, and guy, I've read many of his articles, he's a great guy, Sh shivaniapologetics.com, he attacks critical race theory and, and addresses it, um, and it compares it to Christianity, Vody Bachman, Tony Evans, John Perkins, Perkins are all great people, you've probably heard of those people before, they're awesome preachers, definitely check them out, amazing people. So, that wraps it up. I hope you, um, if you have questions, feel free to comment below. I'd love to try to uh, get in conversation with you. Share this with other people. Also, definitely check out my website at iapologia.com uh, and Facebook pages, iapologia.com. I also have a more of a cultural, social, political Facebook pages and Twitter pages called Liberty Bomb. Do check that out as well. So uh, definitely follow up. And um, I'm going to encourage you with one last piece of advice. Go out and change your world for Christ.